This is lecture number 10 in a series of 22 Old Testament lectures on the chaotic kingdom stage. In the last few moments of lecture 9, we were discussing the book of Jonah, and we were reading verse 3, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. We had spent a few moments there discussing that, that it's impossible for the believer to get away from the presence of the Lord. He can get away from God's blessing, but not, that is to say, so he won't enjoy God's blessing, but he cannot get away from the presence of the Lord. And he goes down to Joppa. Many years later, some nine centuries later, God will speak to another uh, Jewish evangelist by the name of Simon Peter at Joppa, and he'll also tell him to minister to some Gentiles, Cornelius and his household. And here now God speaks to uh, Old Testament Hebrew evangelist by the name of Jonah and tells him to minister to some uh, Gentiles, to some Ninevites. Both men were reluctant. Simon Peter was a little reluctant and God had to uh, use a special vision in order to prove to Simon Peter his call. And here Jonah is even more reluctant because he actually attempts to flee from the very land of Israel. All right, verse 4, The Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was in danger of being broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them, but Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. I think this is sad when unsaved men have to call upon a prophet of God, and awaken him and ask him to pray. Verse 7, And they said, Every one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. Casting of lots is both an Old Testament and a New Testament procedure. Apparently God sanctioned this, and even unsaved people used this method uh, in the land division of Israel in Joshua chapter 15, uh, this was chosen, the land was chosen by the casting of lots. And then uh, this sinner, Achan, in Joshua chapter 7, his identity was revealed by the casting of lots. And also in uh, Acts chapter 1, Matthias was chosen to succeed Judas and become one of the twelve apostles by the casting of lots. So they do this, and they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. No doubt in my mind, God sanctioned this, that is to say, he impressed these pagan sailors to do this and made sure that the lot then uh, fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and from where comest thou what is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. He really didn't, in a sense. When we really fear the Lord, I mean, he was afraid now of the Lord. He was certainly afraid of what God was going to do to him. But the beginning, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And of course, if a man fears God, he's going to obey him in the first place. And Jonah did not have the fear that he needed to have. He was afraid of God, but uh, he did not have that reverential respect that a believer should have concerning the Lord. But he gives his testimony, and uh, so in verse 10, Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? So apparently now between verse 9 and 10, although we don't have the record of what he says, he actually related to them well, fellows, here's the problem. I was called to go to Nineveh, and I chose not to, and we're in a peck of trouble because of my disobedience. Whatever else we can accuse Jonah of, he certainly was not guilty of lying. 
And uh, they said, why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, what shall we do for thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea raged and was tempestuous. Verse 12. Then he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm for you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is come upon you. Now, in our notes we ask the question, why did Jonah disobey God? Several theories have been suggested. Number one, He was simply a backslidden, lazy prophet. And of course, that's just not true at all. He was backslidden, but he wasn't lazy. And secondly, he was a coward. And he didn't want to go to Nineveh because he felt he'd be killed. Well, I don't believe that for a moment. Uh, If you notice verse 12 here, you cannot come to that conclusion. Here's a man who asks the sailors to toss him overboard into a wild and to a stormy sea in the midst of this boiling ocean. And no coward would ever think of doing something like this. And these men are pagan men, but they're good men. And we hope that maybe later on some of them got saved. Because in verse 13, even though he tells them to do this, and even though they feel perhaps by doing this we might save our own skins, nevertheless the men rode hard to bring her to land, but they could not, for the sea raged and was against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let not us perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hath done as it pleased thee. I don't know, I think there's a real possibility that these men may be in heaven right now. I don't know. Notice verse 15, They took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. I wonder what vows they made. They may have made the vow, O God, we'll serve you and believe you and worship you the rest of our lives. The reason I say this is that the word of God says on one occasion, for God uh, worketh the, uh, the wrath of men, the Lord worketh the wrath of men for his own glory. And God likes to take even the wicked, bad, horrible things in our life and turn them around for something good and sweet and wonderful. In Romans 8, verse 28, a verse off quoted, sometimes uh, not very often understood fully, the Lord, the Bible says in Romans 8.28, uh, concerning uh, the life of the believer, it says, uh, or I should say, it gives the idea that God is going to work out all things for our good, but it does not say that all things are good, but simply God makes all things, some bad things, work out for his good. And here was a bad thing, uh, a disobedient prophet and a terrible storm, and all these things, frightened sailors, these things are bad. And yet God may take these bad things and work them for his good. It's entirely possible these men were saved. Verse 17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. All right. Jonah protesting, chapter 1. Now, chapter 2, Jonah praying. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason. Apparently now he may be writing down his memoirs later. Apparently this is what he, as he remembered praying in that horrible time. I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord And he heard me out of the belly of Sheol, a very grave, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. 
Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thine holy temple. And you see, in the Old Testament, in First Kings, we're told that when the temple was dedicated, that Solomon prayed this prayer that when the Israelis were in trouble, they would look to the temple and to the God of that temple for deliverance. And now he does that. He's attempting to find out from the heart of the uh, from the uh, belly of the fish and the heart of the earth, that is to say, in the, the bottom of the sea, which direction is east and which is west and north and south. But he says, I will look again toward thine holy temple. The waters compass me about, even to the soul. The depths closed me round about. What a picture we have here. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, you know, it wasn't until about 50, 60 years ago with modern sonar and radar and everything that we knew anything about the, the huge, mountainous, towering, mountainous range, uh, various ranges, and the deep chasms in the bottom of the sea. There are mountains in the ocean higher than Mount Everest, and there are canyons deeper than the Grand Canyon. And here, Jonah, who takes the first submarine trip in history, speaks about these, the bottoms of the mountains, and the earth with its bars was about me forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple." Now, that word remember doesn't mean that he'd forgotten God, but it meant that he now determined to do something about it, to take it seriously. In Genesis 8, during the flood, we're told, and God remembered Noah. It isn't that he said, oh yes, I, you know, I've forgotten all about that rascal. I'm destroying the rest of the world, but, but I better, uh, better not forget about Noah. I better take care of him. But it meant that God seriously considered the actions he would take concerning Noah. God remembered, God took care of, God honored Noah. And here now he's going to seriously consider keeping the vows that he once made and doing those things that he once promised God he would do. He's not going to treat the word of God or the God of the word lightly. He says, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. In verse 8, we have a very interesting verse. Certainly how true it is in the life of the believer. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. God is filled with mercy. He desires to pardon. But the Bible says, what's wrong? It's not that God says, my hand is short or my ear is deaf, or my muscles are uh, powerless. I want to save you. I want to hear from you. I want to speak to you. I want to have fellowship with you, will you. But he says, your sins have separated you from me. The believer's sins limits the mighty, omnipotent, omniscient God uh, so that he can't bless us. And here... The Bible says, uh, uh, Joel admits, I'm sorry, Jonah admits that if we observe lying vanities, then we forsake our own mercy. Someone has said that the blood of Christ will automatically, instantaneously cleanse us from every sin, but not from one excuse. And as long as Jonah had excuses for disobeying God, he forsook the mercy that God desired to pour upon his life. Verse 9, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Really, that's what the Old Testament sacrificial Levitical uh, system was all about. God tells Moses, he said, What does the Lord, and Moses then told the nation Israel in the book of Deuteronomy, What does the Lord desire of thee but to circumcise the foreskin of thine heart? See, God wasn't nearly so much concerned with the outward rite, R-I-T-E, the ceremony of circumcision. He was concerned about the circumcision of the heart, and he wanted that kind of thanksgiving offering. 
Now, God did lay down orders, of course, for to govern the sacrifice, the burnt offering, and uh, the meal offering, and the trespass offering, and the sin offering, and the drink offering, and other offerings. But the offering that God delighted in more than any others was the offering of sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Notice the statement, I will pay that that I have vowed. Perhaps years ago, uh, Jonah went forward maybe in a service and he said, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll be what you want me to be. He made that vow. God did not take that vow lightly. And now Jonah is remembering that vow. He's going to take it seriously. I'll do, he's saying now, what you want me to do. And then really these next five words are a brief miniature summary of the entire Bible. Salvation is of the Lord. Not from a Baptist church or a pope or a priest or a creed or a denomination or a system, but salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Now, chapter 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Thank God that Jesus Christ, that our God, is the God of the second chance. How many times in my life have I muffed it? How many times have I not done those things that God wanted me to do? And how many times have I done those things God did not want me to do? But one of the great blessings in the book of Jonah to my own heart is this verse, He came unto Jonah the second time. He spoke to Simon Peter the second time. One time, he turned and looked upon Simon Peter. Simon Peter was cursing him out. I do not know this no good blankety-blank man. That's what he said to some soldiers beside a fire outside the courtroom of the high priest. But God, the Lord Jesus, spoke to him the second time. The second time was by the Sea of Galilee a few days later. And he asked the question, Simon, do you love me? If so, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, the God of the second chance. And then there was a man named John Mark who had been called by the Apostle Paul to go on the first missionary journey. He got about uh, halfway there and he, as we would say today, sort of turned chicken. He went back to mama. He was a mama's boy. And later on, though, the Apostle Paul calls for John Mark to visit him right before he dies, that is to say, before Paul dies, and he says, bring John Mark with you, for he is profitable for the ministry, the God of the second chance. The word of the Lord came into Jonah the second time, saying, arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Of course, forty in the Bible is uh, a type of judgment. There were 40 years in the wilderness, the children of Israel. And our Lord Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. And there are other chances, or there, uh, there are other uh, illustrations we could give along this line. 40 days they have to repent. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even unto the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered himself with sackcloth and satin ashes. Now, 
as I introduced the book of Jonah, I made this statement. This book includes the record of the greatest fish story of all time, but it is not found in Jonah chapter 2, but rather in Jonah chapter 3. Years after the book of Jonah was written in the Gospel of Luke, our Lord Jesus appears to four fishermen on the blue Sea of Galilee. Their names were Peter and Andrew and James and John. They were fishermen and they were brothers. And our Lord said, follow me and I will make you to be fishers of men. In other words, he was saying, you know how to catch physical fish, marine creatures that swim. Follow me, though, drop your nets, leave that type of living, and I will teach you how to catch human fish, fishers of men. And so they became fishermen for Jesus' sake. But here is the greatest catch of fish in the history of the world. The biggest fish story of all time It does not take place in the bottom of the Mediterranean, but rather on the plains of the city of Nineveh. More people, apparently, were saved at this time than any other time since Genesis 1 was written. The biggest fish story of all time. Jonah led more to God and than any other man, more than a Billy Sunday, more than an Apostle Paul, at least for this one particular message that he preached. It wasn't, a, wasn't an extensive ministry, or a, uh, a message. It certainly wasn't long. It wasn't involved. Repent, yet within 40 days Nineveh shall be overthrown. If we take this at face value, and I don't know how else to take the Bible except to take it literally, this would mean that in heaven someday we will fellowship with more Ninevites that were living about the 7th century B.C. than with the, uh, then will we with the Israelis that were living in Israel at that same time. For they never experienced a revival like this. There will be a revival, as I understand the Bible, that will supersede this one, and that will not take place until the tribulation. And you read Revelation chapter 7 concerning the multitude of people that will be saved during that time. But until that time, this is the biggest fish story of all time. And in verse 10, God of chapter 3 saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented, he changed his course of action now, of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Of course, the word evil here does not necessarily mean sin. It doesn't in this passage. All evil is not sin. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, this has bothered some, because the Bible says, I am the Lord, I create evil. And it's a Hebrew word, ra, R-A, and it often means calamity, judgment. And what he's saying here is that he changed his course of action concerning the judgment, the calamity that he was going to uh, level upon this city. And he did it not. All right. Jonah protesting, chapter 1. Jonah praying, chapter 2. Jonah preaching chapter 3, and what a place to end the book. And here he is in, uh, and he's uh, a blaze of glory, as it were. But there is another chapter, Jonah pouting. I made the statement several times, let me make it again. Class, the Bible is not a book that man could write if he would, or would write if he could. I'll tell you, if I could have written the Bible, I would not have included Jonah chapter 4. I would have included the backslidden prophet in 1, and the persecuted prophet, the chastised prophet in 2, and the preaching prophet in 3, but not the pouting prophet 
in four. I just wouldn't have included that. But God writes it and tells it the way it is. The greatest fish story of all time, chapter 3. But, chapter 4 opens, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. What in the world is this fellow angry? And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled from before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Now, Lord, isn't this what I said? This is exactly the thing that I was afraid would happen. Now you've done me in. And I just, it's hard for me to believe that he would actually say what he did say in verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from thee, for it is better for me to die than to live. In other words, if you're going to spare these Ninevites and not send them to a Christless hell and burn them forever, then I'd rather die now rather than have any fellowship with them on this earth. Remember at the beginning of the lecture I said that Jonah chapter 4 is a sad commentary on Romans 7 verse 18. Paul writes these words as a believer, For I know that in me that is in my flesh there dwelleth no good thing. I probably should not have made a statement I made a while ago. I said, I'm amazed that Jonah would make a statement like that, but I know myself and I realize that in me there dwelleth no good thing and that I probably would have been tempted maybe to do something just as bad. Verse 4, God attempts to reason with his prophet. We would have sent Jonah to hell if it had been us. Thank God the Lord does not deal with us this way. Then said the Lord, Dost thou well to be angry? Apparently Jonah doesn't even answer him now. Did you ever have God speak to you? You wouldn't even speak to him. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there he made a booth for himself, sort of a leafy vine-like protection, and sat under the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. The only reason he hung around, as it were, he was hoping against hope that perhaps the revival would be short-lived and would abort itself, wouldn't be uh, sincere enough as far as God was concerned, and he could still then view the lightning come down from heaven and destroy this city as it had once destroyed the city of Sodom. That's what he was hoping. God would uh, eventually still destroy the city of Nineveh. In verse 6, And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm. Notice the things that God prepared in the book of Jonah. He prepared a storm. He prepared a fish. He prepared a wind. Now he prepares a gourd. He prepares a worm. And in verse 8, he prepares an east wind. God was well prepared when he dealt with his servant. God is well prepared when he deals with with you and me today. Are we prepared when we deal with him? That's a very important subject, by the way, prepar uh, being prepared. I think uh, the book, I believe, of Amos says, prepare to meet thy God. That's the message that God would have to the sinner, but the message to the saint would be, prepare to serve thy God. And often in the Old Testament, the story of the kings, whether they are good or bad, uh, pretty well was determined by whether they prepared their hearts. Uh, of all the kings that were saved, we read this statement about them. Now Jehoshaphat, or now Hezekiah, or now Josiah, or whoever, prepared his heart to seek the Lord. And many of the ungodly kings we read, but they prepared not their hearts to seek God's will. 
God was prepared as he dealt with Jonah. Verse 7, he prepared a worm. When the morning, I think he already had a worm that he prepared some 40 or 50 years ago by the name of Jonah. When the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered, and it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, for the second time he says it now, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. In other words, Jonah apparently thought more of a gourd than he did of human souls. And this attitude continues in the New Testament. The citizens of the city of Gadara in Mark chapter 5 thought far more of hogs than they did of the maniac of Gadara because our Lord had healed the maniac, and because of that some 2,000 pigs had perished. The evil spirits left the man and went into the pigs, and they were drowned. And uh, we're told that uh, when the citizens came, they asked Jesus, in fact, they insisted that Jesus leave the country because they thought more of, we say, of pigs than of a person. And Jonah does this now. And verse 10, God once again, attempts to reason with him. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city in which are more than six score thousand persons? That's a 120,000 people. But that's not the limit of the population. These are people that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. Actually, 120,000 children, those below the age of accountability. Now, those children had moms and dads and uncles and aunts, and here we're talking about, excuse me, perhaps as many as a half a million people. And God says, should I not spare that city? And... Uh, not only that, I want to spare the city, but also they have much cattle. There's livestock. There are four-legged animals, as well as men and women and boys and girls in that city, and I desire to save them also. If you've never read the book of Jonah, and you're listening to these tapes, you may be saying, now, okay, Wilmington, hurry up now, tell us, how does the story end? What does Jonah do next? How does he answer God? I wish I knew. I really do. A lot of times people say, when I get to heaven, after seeing Jesus and some of my loved ones, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the Apostle Paul and ask him if he really wrote the book of Hebrews. Well, frankly, I couldn't care less. I believe he did, but I, I just never lost any sleep over that. Or, or when I get to heaven, I'm going to try to find out who those sons of God really were in Genesis 6. Uh, well, uh, I'm really not too concerned about that either. But you know one thing I am concerned about? I, I assume, in fact, I have no doubt I'll see Jonah in heaven, but I'm going to say, Jonah, if there had been a chapter 5, or what happened really in chapter 5? Jonah, did you really get right with the Lord? Did he finally get through to you? And I like to think, had there been a chapter 5, that God finally would get to him and uh, I would like to have that chapter describe Jonah kneeling in that hot, blazing sun in a hill, on a hill, overlooking the city of Nineveh. And I would like to have read where his tears uh, dropped from his weeping eyes as he asked God to forgive him for his attitude. And, and I'd like to think that after this he goes down and perhaps attempts to give the right hand of fellowship to a number of the uh, men and women who repent during this great revival in Jonah chapter 3. I don't know. The story may not have ended that way, but uh, however it ends, as far as we're concerned, we have no more information about it. Well, let's take one more book. I think we have about 12, 10 to 12 minutes left. The book of Amos. 
We've looked at Obadiah, the book of Joel, the book of Jonah, now the book of Amos. You'll notice that we didn't say anything about the fish and about a man actually being swallowed by a fish because you have these notes in your textbook. And by the way, when I add this extra material, and I try to add extra materials, we go through the, uh, the lectures here. If the uh, material is not found in your textbook, you, of course, will not be responsible for this material on a test. Only the textbook material you will be required to know on the test. But I try to dress this up as, a, as it were and try to add a few things extra to you, or for you, I should say, on these uh, tapes. All right, in our notes, then, we have the time duration of Amos' ministry, suggested at 765 B.C., to 750 B.C. means that Amos prophesied, ministered for around 15 years. The name Amos, of course, means burden. Now, this could refer to his birth or a prophecy concerning his heart. Uh, they named people in those days after certain things, and perhaps uh, Naaman's, uh, or Amos's mother, when she found out that he was on his way, that she was pregnant with child, perhaps she didn't want him. And, uh, but they had enough sense in those days not to try abortion because they realized that life began in the womb and that God would regard that as murder if they tried to abort a life before even that life uh, was fully developed from the womb at birth. God still held this as murder. And so maybe after the birth, though, she named the child Burden, or this could have meant later on uh, a prophecy concerning the burden of his heart over the sins of Israel. Amos was a southerner who ministered to the north. As far as I know, he was the only one to live in the south and minister to the north. There were other prophets who ministered to the north, but most of them lived there. He was a lay evangelist. Notice his testimony in chapter 7, verse 14 and 15, he said, I am no prophet, neither am I a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. Now I said, the beginning of the lectures on the minor major prophets, that the Old Testament prophet was on a number of occasions trained in schools. Samuel had established the school of the prophets, but uh, God did not limit his prophets to their education in the school, and sometimes he picked a, a farmer or a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And here Amos is not uh, a prophet's son. He's not a PK, a preacher's kid. And he's not the trained theologian. God just chose him. Amos' style is that of a Billy Sunday. And his book, the book of Amos, consists of eight judgments upon eight nations. And then five visions concerning judgment. There was the locust plague, a great fire. He sees the plague of a plumb line a basket of ripe fruit, and the Lord at the altar. This locust plague, Amos sees God determining to punish Israel at that time with a horrible locust plague because of their sin. And Amos prays and he averts judgment. And this locust plague then does not actually become a plague. He just sees it as a vision. And same with the great fire. He sees this other plague, a great fire, and he prays, and then God determines not to destroy Israel by a fire. But the next vision that he sees God does use, he uses, he sees the vision of a plumb line. God himself seems to be the plumb line, and God measures Israel against his own righteousness. You see, people don't do that today. You can ask someone concerning Christ, whether they've accepted him as Savior, 
And they would say, well, I suppose I've never done that, but really, you know, I'm not as bad as such and such. And they go to church. Now, I don't care how honoring and low you may be. You can always find some poor devil that's a little lower on the totem pole than you are, that's done more things and said more bad things than you have. But we are not to measure our righteousness against any other person's righteousness. That's the sin of the world today. According to Second Corinthians, they measure their righteousness against the righteousness of men. Now, you can prove uh, a table, an ordinary uh, table that you would uh, eat from, you can prove that that table is a mile long if you use a perverted ruler to do it. But if you use a regular ruler uh, and uh, of a standard measurement, you'll, of course, see it as not a mile. But uh, God says, I'm using a plumb line of my righteousness, and I'm going to show Israel how short she really is when it comes to my divine heavenly standards. And then he sees a basket of ripe fruit. And this ripe fruit actually is rotten fruit about ready to be consumed, thrown out by the Lord. And then finally he sees the Lord at the altar. Normally this would mean when God is at the altar that there's going to be blessing and the presence of God and fellowship. But now God is going to pronounce judgment and he's at the altar to do business as far as a judge, like a judge would do behind uh, the bar in a courtroom. Uh, Jonah, I'm sorry, Amos now becomes then the weeping prophet of the north. And he weeps over the sins of the north as Jeremiah, a little later on, will weep over the sins of the south. Um, let's see, I'm not sure what else we should say by way of introduction. And uh, I think I'll stop the tape here, and during the next hour now we'll actually take the book and go through it, if not verse by verse at least, chapter by chapter. There are some uh, nine chapters, of course, in the book of Amos, and I want to call your attention to a few passages in each of these chapters. So we'll end this tape at this point.